Okay, let's get this out of the way right now. I did not dress theologically today. <laughs> For those of you who missed the last week, my dear pastor and my favorite son-in-law, mentioned that he tries to dress kind of like what the message is going to be theologically. And then he went on to say that theologically, from Scripture, David danced before the ark in his underwear. I wondered if I was going to do that. <laughs> Obviously not. However, you have to know this. My mother, bless her heart, determined that I should learn how to dance in a ballroom. So I had three years of ballroom dancing lessons. So I can't promise that I'm not going to break out some moves. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm going to date. How many of you remember the Musketeers? <laughs> Do you remember one of those Musketeers' names was Bobby Burgess? Later to move on to the Lawrence Welk show and dance there. Bobby Burgess taught me to dance. <laughs> he did. He did. It was unbelievable. <laughs> but I tell you, you don't have to worry. I am Nazarene qualified. As long as one foot remains on the platform, I can dance. I promise. When I thought of ordinary worship, some thoughts came to me. First of all, worship is an on-purpose encounter with the living and holy God. Oh yeah, sometimes it breaks out when we're in the middle of something. Uh, living in Colorado, there were times when I looked at the mountains and just praised God. But more often than not, it was an on-purpose encounter. It was something I did because I loved God. Worship is reserved for God alone. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we, we get into the scripture this morning. Worship acknowledges who God is. He's God. He is the creator. He is the sustainer. He is high and lifted. And you and I have the privilege of worshiping God because Christ died on a cross for us. Pray with me in a minute. Okay. As we enter in now to, to really grasp all that this scripture has. I pray, first of all, that you take the speaker of the hour, hide him so far behind the cross of Christ that only Christ is seen. I pray that our hearts and minds would be clear that what you have to say to us today, by your spirit, will ring loud and clear. And most of all, Father, I just pray now that you'd fill this place with your presence and your glory. And in all that, I give you praise in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. And amen. For over 25 years, every worship service that I was part of, well, almost every worship service I was part of, had a order of service, a bulletin. You know what I mean, right? You three sing three songs and a chorus, much to the chagrin of some people. Uh, you have a pastoral prayer. You obviously be in the Nazarenes. You take the offering. You have a musical special. And then the preacher preaches a message. You have the benediction. And then you drive like crazy to get the restaurant before the other people get there. <laughs> to me, this was ordinary worship. It was orderly it was tidy. Much 
different than the comparison to the first church of the Nazarene located on 6th Avenue in Los Angeles, California in the middle of Skid Row. That's where Phineas Berthee planted the first church of the Nazarene. Their worship was orderly, but there are accounts of the neighbors being a little bit frustrated with some of the joy that spilled out on the street. It wasn't chaos, but it was this idea that there was so much joy in worship, so much excitement about praising God that it just spilled out. Now, me being the straight-laced, by-the-book preacher that I was, am, there was one Sunday that, that God just got a hold of me. And right in the middle of service, right in the middle of the song service, I decided that we needed a glory mark. The people thought I was crazy. But the kids that joined me in that glory march, they thought it was great. And that wasn't unusual for that first Nazarene church there in Los Angeles. In fact, one of the things they had was white hankies. People would get blessed and they would wave the white hankies. And I was thinking of that preacher, you know, as he preached and the white hankies were waving. Then I thought about the preacher where there was no white hankies waving. But God wants us to worship. And I believe, based on the scripture this morning, God wants us to have ordinary worship. You see, David had just been anointed king of Judah and now king of Israel, all of the nation. And David was a man after God's own heart. Scripture tells us that. And he, he was going to establish his kingdom in Jerusalem and the whole nation. And he wanted the Ark of the Covenant to be in Jerusalem. So he put together the plan. He made a spreadsheet. He gathered the troops. He had a brand new wagon built. He had it taken out of the barn and, and, and put on the wagon. And they started to Jerusalem and there was great celebration. It was ordinary worship. They, they were on their way and they were on that way. And, and the wagon, the wagon hit a rock. And Uzzah being the great guy that he was, reached out and held the ark. And that's when ordinary worship went down the tubes. Uzzah wasn't a priest. Uzzah wasn't even a Levite. And God's judgment of that moment was severe. David's reaction to, to God's punishment of Uzzah was to become angry with God. Have you ever become angry with God? Oh, preacher, you can't become angry with God. Yes, you can. Because the God that you and I serve knows us. The God that you and I serve understands us. The God that you and I serve created every emotion you experience, including anger. And you can be angry with God as long as you don't shake your fist in his face. Whether it's disappointment or hurt or loss, God can deal with your anger because he loves us and he cares for us and he desires the best for us. And after David's anger kind of subsided a little bit and fear set in, David feared God. And you know, when we talk about fearing God, 
we, we get all, ooh, well, that's not what we're talking about. I really appreciate what the Amplified Bible does with Proverbs 1.7. Listen to it. It says, fear the reverent and worshipful fear of the Lord is the beginning and the principal and choice part of knowledge. Reverent and worshipful fear. It's coming to realize who God is. David, in this moment, takes a step back. He, he reflects on what's happened. He fears God, realizing once again who God is. And sometimes we forget. God is not your best friend. God is not your cosmic Santa Claus. God is the creator of everything that was ever created. God loves us so much that he, he wants us to come closer to him. He wants us to worship him as who he is. So David has taken a step back. He's recognized once again who God is. And he puts together a new ordinary worship plan. And as I looked at the scripture, I kind of wondered if maybe, maybe David was worshiping the Ark of the Covenant more than he was worshiping the God of the Ark of the Covenant. Because anything that gets between you and God becomes something you worship. Maybe it's a job. Maybe it's a person. Maybe it's an experience. And I'm about ready to really get in trouble, and if you'll notice, I do not look to my left. Maybe it's grandchildren. I never looked at the piano side second row when I preached, and there was a reason for that, because I'm getting that look right now. I know I am. Anything that you and I place between us and God is something that we worship. And that's not what God wants. God wants us to worship him and him alone. And so David takes a step back. He, he brings things together. He, he noticed that God, as Pastor Jeff alluded to, you know, the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant is sitting in a barn. We also see that Odom Edom is being blessed because he's taking care of it. So David's new ordinary worship plan, first of all, he remembers that that ark was not to ride on a brand new wagon. God had told Moses that the ark of the covenant was to be carried by the Levites on poles. I just read again about how the ark was constructed. With all that gold and the two tablets, Jeff would not have been one of the carriers. I'm not sure I could have been one of the carriers. But David brings the Levites in to carry the ark. And they begin to move. And can you imagine they take six steps and they sacrifice two animals? Wow. No, I didn't do the calculation because I wasn't sure exactly how far, but that's a lot of animals. But the real interesting thing is how David expressed 
his worship. With his whole heart, he was dancing wildly in front of the ark. He was expressing his worship from the heart. He was expressing it as something that just drove him. Can you imagine those with him? Those who caught the fever of his worship? Have you ever thought how you worship affects the person sitting next to you? Have you ever thought that your stoic, gee, I'm sorry I'm here attitude affects the person next to you that really wants to worship a God that's blessed them this week? I'm not talking about that we, we put an act on because God doesn't want actors. He wants worshipers. David was worshiping God in a way that he couldn't control. He saw God move. He understood God and feared him, which brought understanding to him, and he decided he was going to worship God with all of his might and all of his strength. And he became a worship leader in a magnificent way because he worshiped. And I'm going to pick on this young man over here. I love it when Joe goes to worship. All of a sudden, the guitar playing stops, and he's worshiping God. He's, he's acknowledging that his God is in control. I'm not saying that, that worship is, is wild and unruly. What I'm saying is worship is you expressing your love to God in a way that's you. Every person should worship God according as they wish, as they have, as God has touched them. So David, he gets to Jerusalem. I'm not sure. I should have checked the mileage. Not sure how the mileage was. But he's dancing all the way, and he enters Jerusalem, and he's still dancing wildly in his underwear. And there were some people there that thought that wasn't appropriate. Macau looks down and sees King David dancing wildly. And she becomes disgusted with him. And when he gets home, she, she tells him, you know, you, what were you doing? What were you doing? You're king. The slave girl saw you and, and the way you were acting. And David said, I don't care. I don't care. I was worshiping God from the depths of my heart. I was sharing my love for him as he has shared his love with me. Ordinary worship is based on who you are. Because God has created you uniquely. He has prepared you to love him the way you love him. Several weeks ago, we sang a chorus. And as I was putting this, this message together, I thought to myself, I've talked about ordinary worship. And there are going to be some folks sitting there in the crowd thinking about, okay, so what? What, what, is, what does ordinary worship mean to me? And I found about this chorus, and I think it, it opens up some thoughts. It opens up some, some possibilities. And no, based on the fact that Pastor Jeff has already ex expressed the fact that musical ability is not a spiritual gift given to the Welch family, I'm not going to sing, but I want you to listen. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, oh, my soul, rejoice. Take joy, my King, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. And I, and I looked at that chorus, and, and it, it struck me. I love you, Lord. Real 
ordinary worship begins in the heart. It begins with a complete selling of the heart to the Lord. Oh yeah, there's some head stuff that goes on. You have to know some stuff. But that's what these folks are for. They've thought about it. They've prayed about it. They plan the worship service for us. And their whole intent is to bring you and I to a place that we worship God from our hearts. They have work's been done. The heart work is what takes the place. Our love for God. In response to the fact that he loved us, even when we were sinners, should be a worship that is overwhelming to our hearts. The question, does our worship truly reveal how much we love God? I don't know about you. I, I love this young lady over here with all my heart and all my soul. I did eye drops for six weeks for her. <laughs> and guess what? Starting in September, she's going to do it for me. But I love Sarah so much that I'm going to do everything I can to show her that love. That's the way our worship. When we say, I love you, Lord, our worship should be so over the top that God has no doubt on how much we love him. And I lift my voice. Ordinary worship. And I'm not just talking about volume. I have been blessed with a voice that carries. Just ask my children and grandchildren. But we have more than this verbal voice. I think one of the greatest voices you and I have in society is our life. One of the greatest opportunities to shout to the Lord is to live a life so Christ-like Ginger, I'm going to do it. That people think you're weird. Our life should be so different from those who are not part of the Christ family that they think we're weird. And we're so weird, they want to ask us, why are you so weird? Why are you so strange? What, what is it about your life that, that makes you live the way you do? And, and we would like to live that way also. I raise my voice to worship you. Ordinary worship is from the inside out. I've already told you that, that our praise team and, and our pastor putting the service together, that's just to allow us from the inside out to worship our God. Our soul is so overwhelmed with joy that we can't contain it. Our, our soul is so blessed by the fact that God loved us and continues to love us that we want to worship him. We want God's love not just to flow into us, but ooze, that's another, that's another theological term, ooze. Ooze out of us, all over people. We, we want to be able to rejoice. Let our soul be seen. Take joy, my king, in what you hear. Worship is not about us. I think one of the things that really 
disappointed me and discouraged me as I, as I observed the church, not as a whole. It was the places where worship became a presentation, became a, a performance. And I understand the technology, and I understand the lighting, and all that's got to be good. But when we talk about take joy, my king, in what you hear, it's not about a performance. It is about heart felt worship of a holy God that loved us so much that he allowed his only begotten son to die on a cross for us. When we stop and take that reminder, along with the reminder of who God is, when we think about who God is and in all of enormity, and we think about the cost it is for you and I to call ourselves Christian. How can we help but not worship? How can our worship not become ordinary and, and, and constant for him? So I go back. What does your ordinary worship look like? Have you had that moment, that point in time where you've realized who God is? For David, it took a good guy dying, not Christ, but who's a, doing the right thing. He, he, was, he thought he was doing the right thing. For David to stop and remember who God was. Yes, he got angry with God, but then he began to have knowledge, that, that fear of who God is. Our last, well, one of our assignments, it wasn't the last one, there was, there was a group of, of people who were very much into Southern gospel music. To the point of they brought some very well-established Southern Gospel groups to perform at the church. And it, it was an awesome to, to be part of that. But one of those groups, and I don't remember which one it was, one Saturday night they had a song. And it so struck me that I, I bought the CD, and the next day, before worship service started, I played it. And one of, the, one of the verses was, if you are part of the family and you know it, let your face show it. Father God, I praise you today for the privilege of coming before you and proclaiming worship. Proclaiming that you are God and it is you who we worship today. May we do so from the depths of our heart and all our soul be in it. In this I pray in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.